Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where people are building a better future. Today, Abe Cambridge is doing that. Abe, thanks for coming to the program. Thanks for having me here. So we wanted to talk about Bitcoin. We wanted to talk about renewable energy. But I liked the, the point that you brought up initially, the, the parallel between the two in terms of decentralization of everything. Tell me, where are you? Who are you? How do you get here? And why is this something fascinating? My name is Abe Cambridge. I'm currently sat in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'm a solar energy entrepreneur, I'm also a climate change scientist, and uh, I set up Sun Exchange to allow anyone in the world to own solar panels and, and make money from them. And, and that's, that's what we set out to achieve and have achieved. But I think what's really important is to kind of pricey um, or, or expand a little on, on the, the point of of solar power and the point of cryptocurrency in general. Um, these are technologies, okay? They, they, they've, they were created in 2008, 2009 into the market. Um, and I mean, solar panels and have been around for 100 years or so, but only commercially um, brought forward in 2008, 2009. Um, and, they, and they were brought, these technologies evolved, they emerged as a, as a solution to some of the problems we're facing internationally, which is, um, increasing energy costs because whilst you're using a finite resource of a fossil fuel um, and those fossil fuels causing environmental harm um, the actual cost of using a finite resource increases the more people need energy so you're having increasingly expensive energy costs and even in the UK where I'm from energy poverty is a real thing you know people actually not being able to heat their homes um, because energy costs are increasing because of the increasing demand on, on fossil fuels um, and at the same time, 2008, 2009, the world hit the financial, um, the financial catastrophe um, that, that the world faced, um, which as a, as a result, money is now becoming worth less over time because of the quantitative easing that was put into place to, to, to make up the mistakes that were made by the, by the financial sector. Um, it basically reduces the purchasing power of our, of our normal money. And, and so for both, people, quantitative easing is just putting more money into the economy, essentially, to stimulate it, it's the, it's the central banks pressing a print button and flooding the market with, with more money. And obviously the more money gets into circulation, the, the less worth the money in circulation has in, in, a, in, a, in a purest sense. Um, and um, the, so really the you know, solar power and, and cryptocurrency are technological fixes um, to both of those global issues. So solar panels are a, a commodity um, and the more people buy that commodity, the cheaper they become. So the more people buy solar panels, the cheaper solar panels are, um, which is like the complete inverse of, of fossil fuel energy. And likewise with, uh, with cryptocurrency, i.e. I, Bitcoin, as a finite resource of money, the more people use it, the more expensive, the, so the more, more valuable um, those, those cryptocurrencies become. So you completely transition away from a world of finite, um, finite, uh, sorry, we, we complete transition from a world of, um, infinite money and finite resource and you then transition into a world of an um, infinite resource and a finite money so you, it basically becomes cheaper to buy energy into the future once you transition away from once you flip my group the energy flipping you flip from from fossil fuels to solar um, and then and all of a sudden energy becomes cheaper as we go as we go forward and, and not more expensive and that's, that's really the transition, that tipping point that we, that we passed in around 2008, 2009. Um, I, I call it the, the, the movement into the silicon age, you know, the, the true silicon-based economy. You know, we're, we're now able to produce um, electricity using silicon chips when exposed to the sun. Um, and uh, with, with cryptocurrency, we now have a monetary system um, based and being run on silicon chips. Uh, so this is an entirely now solid-state economy, uh, moving away from you know, burning... Uh, coal and burning oil in big power stations and digging gold out the ground in order to have as a, a reserve in, in a vault somewhere. This is now entirely digital, entirely, entirely solid state and, and, and a system that's really befitting of, of an advanced society. Which of the two developments is more exciting for you, cryptocurrencies or solar or renewable? What's really exciting for me is when the two things merge and when you start solar powering cryptocurrency and you're, you know, you're powering Bitcoin mines with solar power. And then, the, and I'd say more importantly is what you do with the, with the Bitcoin that's being produced, like what you spend it on. Um, so I mean, the, the platform that we've built was built 
not specifically, but in, in to enable people that use cryptocurrency to convert that theoretical wealth into something that's real, physical and tangible, like a solar panel, but then gives an income paid out over time. So what for me, that's what's interesting is that is that is that merging point that that nexus where the two things cross, you know, that, that fusion happens when money and sunshine become the same thing. You know, in fact, if you can now start converting sunlight into money and that money is in cryptocurrency, you then have a completely decentralized way of earning money just from a solar panel could be positioned anywhere else on Earth um, in a way that's transnational. And to make it, go ahead. So I would say that no one owns sunlight. Um, you know, the planet is rotating. Um, so a, a individual should be entitled to position their solar panel anywhere on, on Earth, provided that there's a place to put it. Um, and you know, our, our platform, the Sun Exchange, now allows people to locate their solar panels on a roof, powering a school or a business. Um, so therefore creating a social impact as well. Um, and, and then earning an income from it paid out in, in crypto. And we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for the advancements in cryptocurrency. And this is the, the very fact that there is an ownerless, decentralized, um, transnational currency that we can now use to interact with the whole planet at once. Um, at, which is, is perfectly married to the concept of the whole world being able to extract value from the sun, which is also a transnational phenomenon. Does it need to be transna transnational? Does it need to be ownerless? Mm -hmm. So what we've seen right now is there's been, there was a takeoff in cryptocurrency. There was a bit of a crash after we had an ICO, essentially Wild West. And there will be projects that come out. I think yours is one of the projects that actually does make sense in terms of what you're doing. You're essentially allowing, like Uber did, you're allowing a driver to turn a car into something profitable, but even if they don't have a car, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, allowing, we're allowing people who've got empty roof spaces to allow people who want to own solar panels to put the solar panels on their empty roof space. In return, they get cheaper energy and the owner of the solar panel gets an income from the electricity mm -hmm. producers. But, but uh, just one thing, the Sun Exchange existed before the ICO movement even started. Oh yeah, you guys were, you guys were way yeah. earlier than that. Yeah, we, we were pre-ICO. I mean, Sun Exchange started before Ethereum even existed. Yeah, we, we're, we're long in the tooth in this game by, by, stand, by the measures of things. So why Bitcoin and why cryptocurrency specifically the decentralization aspect and ownerless aspect? I feel like a lot of people would use it if it was a US dollar coin, but then you have the problem of compromising on the morals that cryptocurrency started on. Is that compromise okay. necessary to make it win? I, th I think what we've re re just seen in the last week um, is why Bitcoin exists and its strength in the fact that it's ownerless. So right now, um, Facebook and Libra um, announced that they want to start a cryptocurrency that's essentially pegged the dollar, so it becomes like a stable cryptocurrency. But because there's one person or uh, several organizations standing up saying, we're going to own this thing, it's going to be us, it's a private organization. Um, they are then the, the, the federal government, i.e., Donald Trump, knows who to then say you can't do that, and they have to because they know who they are, and uh, and it's an organisation that could be subpoenaed. Um, whilst Bitcoin, which is a protocol, it's just language, it's just data that anyone can run in a permissionless system, you can't shut that down. Um, and yes, there are on the on the guess on the downside. Yes, it's volatile, but it's only volatile if you hold Bitcoin as an investment, as, an ex, as a speculative instrument. But that's not what it was designed for. It was designed to be a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash payment system, which is all that anyone should really be using it for. It just means that the more people that are using it as a payment system, the actual units of data, i.e. the Satoshi units within a Bitcoin, become more expensive to get hold of over time in order to send that value to someone else, to your, to your other peer. Provided that that is sold within 10 minutes, the volatile, volatility on, on Bitcoin's value is negligible at best, or, or at worst rather. So, I mean, it is really just a way to transact and send. I, I've finally applied $100 worth of Bitcoin in South Africa. I send it to you. You then sell it for $100 in the United States. It's taken 10 minutes. We've, you've got your $100. I've get sent you the $100. We just use Bitcoin as the intermediary. That's all it was ever designed to be. Um, and because it's a, a system that's run in a completely decentralized, distributed manner, it's impossible to stop, sh shut this thing down. It's just a protocol. It's just, it's just data at the end of the day. Um, and as a result, it's, it's a lot stronger. Um, it's, um, it's, it's infallible. Um, the, you know, the power of that mining network is so extraordinary. 
um, that you know, nothing nothing in the world comes close to, to com computational power for the Bitcoin mining network at, at now as we speak. So I mean, it's it's the strongest, it's the most liquid and the most valuable cryptocurrency there is. And uh, we use it as the, as the as currency system because when we started Sun Exchange, there was no Ethereum. Um, in fact, I'd even question using Ethereum now, um, but Bitcoin does exactly what we wanted to do and it's got the most mining power behind it. So I would say ideologically, I'm very aligned with you in terms of that would be the world that I would like to see where there's not a government owned currency because I think the government holds several things over your head. They have the military, so they hold a gun to your head and they hold taxes <laughs> to your head, essentially. And then you're locked in by borderless walls, so to speak. Yeah. But in terms of realities we see that people are willing to give away almost anything to get another cute cat picture on facebook they don't care about their data they don't care about their rights and i think bitcoins i think bitcoins limit in terms of the actual number of units that will be produced is ultimately going to be its downfall as a payment platform because as as you said when you have limited supply price goes up so people are just going to yeah. hold something what does the future yeah. of cryptocurrency look like and is there going to need to be for mass adoption? I know that you're very much a believer, but I think, I think libertarians in general are the ones that started this, but will they be the ones that see it through to the end zone, so to speak? Well, I think we're going to see a complete evolution in how, the, in how this is even built and used. I mean, when, when computers or when the internet first existed, it was, it was geeks um, who started emailing each other. No one else had an email address, so emailing seemed pointless, but people did. Um, and right now, we, people say, well, no one accepts Bitcoin, so why would you use it? But over time, you're going to have this gradual development of more and more people using it, which, again, is another parallel to solar power. I mean, when solar power first started, it was, it was, you know, it was just spacecraft and hippies who used solar panels. And, and more and more, like, people just start to realize the actual benefit in using solar because it's, it's actually cheaper to get energy from it um, and and it, it's it's kind of more fun as well because you're producing your own energy and you're not having to go through a, a third party a centralized party in order to get that energy so you, it's, it's much more democratic so anyone with a believer in democracy any believer in democracy should be a should be a fan of cryptocurrency because you're disintermediating um, control um, and not only that but because it's international um, you know, we can accept Bitcoins from any country in the world and when we pay out the lease payments from the solar panels um, Being leased through the Sun exchange platforms the, the user of the platform We can now interact with the whole world using Bitcoin We don't need to choose the dollar if we chose the dollar we'd exclude the European market we'd exclude the Japanese market, but by paying out in Bitcoin Everyone in the world can interact and exchange their Bitcoin for the local currency So it's become it's become the global Currency of the internet. I mean it is money of the internet and the, the internet doesn't have an owner. The internet is decentralized. Um, I mean, the people who uh, uh, Google may uh, argue with that fact, but the fact is that it is, a, it is just a, a, a computer network um, which started with this idea of connecting the world. Um, what if Facebook's you know, Libra coin works? Will that in fact be true or will they ultimately even jump I, to the US dollar? I think that if, if Libra coin gets, gets pulled off, pulled off um, I think firstly, um, it's dangerous. It will, it will highlight that for a start, it will become the most targeted cryptocurrency bar none by hackers. And although it's a permissioned system, so only nodes who are going to be permission can, can run it, I think it's going to be, they're going to find themselves being, you know, the hackers in the world are going to be seeing that as the biggest target that there is for a start. And secondly, because it's a stable coin, um, there, are, there are issues with that. So people could start hoarding Libra um, and then selling it for a discount, which could collapse the currency, which is one, which is one threat. Um, and then the other issue is that by people holding this now cryptocurrency, which is interchangeable with other cryptocurrencies, it really just it val validates cryptocurrency in general. I mean, if you can go to Coinbase and you've got your Libra token, your Libra coin, and it's worth $1 and always will be, and then you're suddenly seeing Bitcoin's worth more. You're going to sell your Libra coin for the Bitcoin that's increasing in value. And you can very easily because you're now a crypto user. You're now a cryptocurrency user. So I think more than anything, it's going to highlight that Libra is already highlighting why Bitcoin is better. Because it can't be shut down. It can't be subpoenaed. The value will increase over time when people use it and, um, and, is, and is ultimately the most secure system. But does anyone really care about that? Because Facebook's not very secure. 
It's owned by one person. He hasn't made yeah. the best decisions. And yeah. he also owns Instagram and WhatsApp. So Facebook's yeah, not working. Exactly. Totally. And um, they could stop you from using your wallet. I mean, if I were to buy something which is against... But you're, you're, thinking from a li- you're thinking from a libertarian perspective. Most people don't yeah. have any of these. See, this is the issue I have is you're thinking from an idealist perspective. I would argue that most people don't think about this and wouldn't care less. Like my bank could do the same thing, but what percentage of the US and what percentage of the world is banked is alternative and even alternative cryptocurrencies. Let's say that, let's say I'm in South Africa and I want to accept payments. Let's say I'm somewhere that has actual, actual backwoods type banking structure. Am I going like, to want like, to? Like most of Africa, yeah. Like most of, okay, yes. Like most of Africa. Let's say yes. I want to do that. Am I going to use WhatsApp and send it via like a Libra coin, which is just how WeChat does it? Or am I going to use a system that doesn't have a name? Well, and- well, people already are. I mean, in Kenya right now, uh, more people are using mobile money, mobile just peer to peer on their mobile phones, um, than have bank accounts. I mean, the the the, uh, the owner of the M-Pesa, which is the company which owns the mobile wallet system, is now bigger than the banks of Kenya. It's 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 bizarre. I mean, it's actually more advanced financial system than than people in the UK. I mean, people in the UK are still scared of internet banking in some instances, and yet you've got people sending money from a mobile phone device. So I think um, socially uh, it's, and behaviorally, people are more used to digital money in, in Africa than, than in most other places in the world. Like they've never had a bank account. So they've, never, they've only ever used hard cash, now they've come straight to kind of mobile money applications. So I think people are gonna be more inclined to use cryptocurrency here than, in fact, we're already seeing it people using cryptocurrency more in particularly in South Africa than other countries per capita. Um, Definitely. But, but for them, Libra coin will be a cryptocurrency, even though it it's will, not technically. It will be, it will be, what it is, it's a more stable, stable coin. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a more trustworthy stable coin because the companies behind it are so big. Um, you know, you've got true USD and you've got US dollar Tether, which are stable coins that are supposedly pegged to the dollar. But no one really knows, is that true? Do they really have one Tether, Tether's not, apparently. There's yeah, just yeah, so much yeah. money beh- not behind I, I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. I don't want to be taken to It's court. okay. You know it's true. But, <laughs> but uh, the fact is that you, you know, someone like Facebook and Visa and MasterCard, the fact that Visa and MasterCard want to get involved with the cryptocurrency project shows that they recognize the writing is on the wall for the old school credit card payment system and that they understand and recognize that the future for money, especially in emerging markets, is cryptocurrency as they're starting their own. And what that will do is it will just validate the other cryptocurrencies which are already in use and, um, and ultimately will, will just drive the Bitcoin, the price up and the more people will join the network. That's my, that's my, that's my, that's my, I say it's my hope, but it's my, uh, my prediction. Digital slash cryptocurrencies are clearly the future because they're better in almost all ways. But awesome. will that, and I still think it'll, I still unfortunately think it'll be behind a large um, third party as opposed to a distributed network just because of getting people on board. If Facebook gets 2 billion. It, it, it probably will. It probably will, you know, they, they probably will, but it will still, um, I mean, if you're saying, if you think that the market cap um, of Libra will exceed that of Bitcoin at some point. I think it'll exceed all of them. Far, you think? Bar, I think bar none, it will exceed absolutely all of them. Well, I, 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 yeah, of course. The world standard for a bank. Okay, but I, I would compare it to, I mean, if you're going to compare Bitcoin to digital gold, you know, you'd say that you know, the amount of money in circulation or the amount of, of credit default swaps in circulation between banks and financial institutions is far greater than the value of gold. Um, and that gold is the only thing of real value in inverted commas in, according to the uh, existing, <laughs> uh, well, the old school financial system where you have to have fractional reserves of gold in your vaults which you're allowed to lend on based on your fractional reserve. Um, and therefore, the, it just kind of proves that if you have a, a, a network like Libra running, which becomes more valuable than Bitcoin, Bitcoin is still going to be there. It's still going to be that, that kind of reserve. You, you've got that, that, uh, that kind of pr- the, the proof of work protocol um, with that amount of power in the background uh, is, is significant. And the fact that it's, it's, it's permissionless, you know, anyone can use Bitcoin. Um, and you know, the, I think one of the other things is this is idea that these 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 currencies um, assist um, cyber cyber crime and uh, money laundering and you know, illicit drug purchasing. 
but I mean, I, I, I've been watching James Bond movies my whole life, and it's always US dollar notes and suitcases that are being used for those kind of activities. And the fact that every transaction on the Bitcoin network is there forever, you can never delete it. So at the moment that someone reveals their, private, their, their public key and that gets identified to a person, that the game is up. So really, you know, the dollars are far more, far easier to use for committing crime than, um, than, than, doing, uh, than using cryptocurrency. So that's a whole other kind of aspect of it, which I think is very much misunderstood. You know, the, the, the record of Bitcoin is, is transparent, it is publicly available, and I think that's actually why, especially some, uh, some governments are against it, because if they're forced to use a public ledger, then the money flows within a, within a government are visible to everybody. And they would have to be for, they would have to share that, show their hand of how public money is actually being spent. You mean lighting it on fire? <laughs> I just think that, uh, uh, for example, you know, governments that are doing things which they shouldn't be, which is very much the case in, in, in emerging markets especially, um, that if they were to force to use a public ledger, then they would have to think twice before performing, you know, before taking public money and then misspending, misappropriating public money. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's kickback from, from it. I agree. I think that governments would love the pros without the cons. They want it to be public with respect to everyone else's transaction. Yeah, because then yeah. you're able to see any tax dodgers and, hmm, where do you get that well, money from? Well, well, that sounds like Libra. I mean, Libra, they track every transaction. They, will be, they can demand to see the transactions, but it's by permission only. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an ideal scenario for a government. Um, and I think what, what Libra is trying to say to, to um, the, the, the federal government right now in the States is saying, look, someone's going to do this. So let it, let's, let, let's be us. Let's, let's be the guys that start this, this global cryptocurrency that everyone uses. Um, do you think they think could that, threaten governments? Um, Especially the U.S. one, if suddenly the U.S. dollar isn't necessarily the global standard, but something else replaces it in terms of transaction volume. Well, I think that in the way that you look at world history, um, you know what what has been the reserve currency. They, every 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 currency has its time. And before the U.S. dollar, it was the British pound. Before the British pound, it was the I don't know. It was before that probably the Roman Roman coin or something. Or before that was a doubloon, or before that it was a seashell. You know, it's like there's always a a time for when something is recognized and used as the, as the global instrument. Um, but I think it's going to transition to a cryptocurrency variant and someone's going to do it. And there's, there's, I wouldn't say it's a race, but there's challenges on um, what, what is that cryptocurrency that's going to be that, that globally used system. But right now, Bitcoin is winning. And I think anyone that understands how cryptocurrencies works understands that these will become the system that we use for payments because the system we have right now sucks. It doesn't just suck in the third world. It sucks everywhere if you're spending 3% on a transaction fee. Exactly. So, that, no, I can put that into really good context, right? There, because the Bitcoin is so much in demand in South Africa, there's, a, there's actually a positive arbitrage. Like People are willing to pay more than 5% more than the globally market uh, value of Bitcoin here. So if someone buys solar panels through our platform, they're actually getting a 5% discount by spending Bitcoin on those solar panels. Whilst if you pay by credit card, you have to pay 2% uh, service fee for the credit card issuer. So you're actually like, it's 7% it's cheaper to, to buy our good with a solar, with, a, with Bitcoin than it is using a credit card. Yeah, and, it's, so it, and it's instant as well. When you play telephone with people and you say one word and it has to go around seven different people, you always get different words at the end. There's, yeah, that, right. little, there's that little, yeah. everybody's hands screw something up a little bit. It's yeah. interesting. It's interesting if you look at the, especially when it comes to Africa, but most, most countries that would be considered developing or third world right now, they're skipping a lot of the transitions that the West has gone through in terms of the transitions to factories, the transitions to mass production, the transitions to having a grid, the transitions to having stable banking infrastructure. They're jumping those, going mobile, going mm -hmm. solar, going crypto. How do you see these trends playing out in the long term? Is this something where... So, for instance, when I when I buy something, in when I buy something in the U.S. versus buying something in China or parts of Europe, it can feel it can feel uh, decades old in terms of how it happens to happen. You've got to pay cash to do this, and we accept cards, but you can't do any type of mobile payments. I feel well, I like, a, I, like I, I can. Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. It's just what. When you get fat and lazy, you get fat and lazy. And sometimes the contender reaches up and goes rocky on you. 
<laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you how things are uh, down here on the ground in, in South Africa. So, I mean, it's, as in most emerging markets, you have these vast informal settlements like townships or flavellas or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's areas around the city it's filled with poverty and crime because people from rural areas um, get up and leave because they want to go to a city to get a mobile phone connection, to get money, to earn money, to get access to electricity. Um, and, and that's why people join these slums. Um, and then the rural areas get, get left behind and, 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 and collapse in, in terms of their societies. So I, mean, I, I visited rural Kenya last year um, in a, for a rural microgrid solar project. Uh, it's a company called Powerhive, um, who we're, we're, we're partnering with. Um, and so now there's this very remote rural community who have a, a, solar, a large solar plant in the middle of their village which distributes electricity to each of each household. And every household now has access to Wi-Fi connection through that same network. And they've all got mobile phones and they pay digital money to each other. So now they can grow cash crops in their village. And rather than walking into town and, and selling it at a market, they can now sell it on the agricultural equivalent of eBay um, in, that, in that community. And so as a result, the, 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 the people growing up in that village, now they have, they have, they can make money, they're connected to the world, and they've got clean, reliable electricity that they don't have to rely on a, on a centralized grid to provide them. Now, if that village didn't have access to a solar powered microgrid and mobile money, the only alternative would be to wait for their government to connect them to the main grid, which can take 10, 15 years, which is probably more likely never to happen. And they will never be able to um, be able to charge their phones and they wouldn't be able to sell their crops to the international market direct. So, and that's all because they've got access to clean electricity. Um, and, and, and solar and decentralized electricity. So it's this prospect, this aspect of decentralization. You don't need to go to this one hub to get what you need now. It can now become distributed and decentralized. So you can now have your own money. You don't need to go to a bank and ask permission to have a bank account. You can own a digital wallet. You can own a cryptocurrency. You can own a solar panel. You can use a solar panel that doesn't have to be connected to a centralized grid. That's what's happening. Um, and I don't think there's any dispute around it. Um, it's you know, it's sustainable development in action. You know, the World Bank is funding projects like this because it, 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 you know, alleviating energy poverty and rural electrification is one of the biggest challenges for, for sustainable development. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a global uh, issue which, which is now being addressed because of decentralization, um, primarily around energy. So it's, it's fascinating to see this, this roll out, but it just needs to happen faster. Um, and so I mean, what, what we're doing is, is facilitating that by allowing our platform users to own solar panels in projects like that, which means we can make these projects happen faster. Uh, because I mean, today, project developers need to go to organizations like the World Bank for funding to pay for the hardware for these projects, which could take a year and two years in some instances. Um, because our platform, the Sun Exchange, is like almost democratizing the, the going ahead of these projects because our users choose whether to put their solar panel into those projects or not. So it, it speeds the whole, it's the whole, it speeds up the whole pr the practice. How do you see the future of crowdfunding, crowd investing? There's been a lot of push and yet there hasn't been a lot of big winners when it comes to the projects and type of things that come out of crowdfunded projects to date, because mm -hmm. it's kind of, I mean, you could say the same thing about ICOs and blockchain a lot. There's a lot of selection bias where, the best projects, the best entrepreneurs, and a lot of times, unfortunately, the most connected ones go to the VCs, get the money, and build something. <coughs> EOS. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, I think that uh, the, the the idea of crowdfunding is uh, for ICOs in general, and that that aspect is going to dismediate traditional VC funding. Um, but I think as we're seeing now, there was an awful lot of projects launched um, over the last couple of years, which never amounted to anything. It was just marketing. It was just, it was just hype um, and, and no business model to speak of. I mean, there's, there's a South African company called Walla. You've now gone under because they, they did an ICO. They raised over a million dollars, um, but they didn't have a business model. They, they weren't making money. They had no revenue model, um, uh, which, is, which, is a, which is a disaster for the people, people involved using that network. I mean, um, that, so, I mean, that people need to do their own due diligence and they need to check what, what they're getting involved with. Um, but I mean, I don't see that phenomenon stopping because it, these some of those platforms do work. I mean, some of the some of the ICO, I think Ethereum was launched an ICO and Ethereum works. It, it does what it's intended to do. Yes, it's being used to train uh, to trade virtual cats. Um, to going back to the, the what you talk about uh, 
kitties, you know, but the uh, Ethereum is now being used to trade virtual cats, put it that way. Um, so, I mean, basically, Pokemon people, cards for people that aren't familiar. It, it, exactly. So, it, so people have built this amazing machine, this decentralized computer, and people now using it to trade virtual cats. So, but I, but I think that's just part of the mid, the maturate the, the maturing of the industry, and gradually more and more businesses will you start using applications, run on these decentralized tools, and then and, and, and traditional money will now start going into buying the tokens which are which these platforms are being uh, run on. Um, and I think the other issue is every every jurisdiction has their own rules and regulations around crowdfunding. So that, and so when you're using um, a, a fiat currency like the dollar or like, like the euro, then you kind of have to completely comply with the regulations of how those currencies can be used. Now, I'm not saying that crowd, the actual raising of investment, you have to comply by the rules in each jurisdiction you're doing that. But how some of these systems are run and operating, they kind of transcend and they, you, don't, you can't really fit traditional rules and regulations into these new models because those tokens are being used in that platform. There's utility around them. Sometimes. Sometimes. And um, I mean, with Sun Exchange specifically, like our business, uh, we're, we're not a crowdfunding platform. Um, we're a way for people to actually directly own a solar panel that's being leased into a project. So it's... If, if it's synthetically and aesthetically it looks like crowdfunding when you get dig down into it it's actually not because people are actually buying an actual piece of hardware which actually exists which you're getting paid for the work that piece of hardware does um, that's, that's measurable um, and it's, that's, like so that's, time, it's like having a timeshare where two different people own it and they're renting it out you're just distributing well, that's a larger actually, norm. It's, it's, it's actually even better than a timeshare because only one person owns it like you own your solar panel and you're supplying, supplying electricity to the solar power plant, which you're getting paid for. Do you have and to buy? Do you have to buy a full a full solar panel, or can you buy half a panel? You can buy a solar cell, and a solar panel is made up of seventy two cells. So the base unit is a solar cell. So that's and, and that's ultimately what the part of the plant doing the work. I mean, the solar cell is the thing producing electricity. So the solar cell is the base unit. You can't go smaller than that. You can't own half a cell, for example, because then it stops being a cell. Um, so we've broken down to the base unit. That's what people are, are buying. We know how much electricity that solar cell has produced and they are getting paid for, for that. Um, and I think the closest analogy would be something like a, a condominium block. So we're basically the commercial, the, the real estate agent for that condo block. And people are buying the apartments in that block um, and then leasing it out to a tenant. They don't know who the tenant is. In, in some instances, sometimes they may do. But basically, us as the real estate agent, our platform facilitates the selling of the apartment units to someone, and that facilitates the finding of a, of a tenant for that apartment. We're doing the same thing just with solar panels, but breaking down to a cell level. So solar and generating energy is one problem. Storage is the other side. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the battery technology, what Elon's doing, and where we're headed? Because right now, it's complicated, to say the least, in terms of integrating solar with the grid and having surges, et cetera. Yeah, there's there's two um, kind of tra there's two tracks of development technology happening now. You've got mobile batteries, which is what Tesla have, have been advancing. But mobile battery solutions, where uh, having energy density and weight as a minimum, so increasing energy density and reducing weight is is their priority. Um, and then you've got things like what I'd call terrestrial applications, like ground based systems, which are fixed, where space isn't a premium and needs weight or mobility. Um, so that's just about reducing the, the cost of energy storage in, in total. Um, and, and with that, we're seeing some really cool advancements and things like flow, flow battery systems, um, gravity battery systems, and, um, and, and super capacitors and, and graphene storage. Um, so really, you've got these two, two worlds, like mo mobile and, and, and fixed. So in both of these worlds now, you're having radical advancements in the, in the cost, cost reduction. You know, exponential dropping of, of cost. So and the more people buy these battery storage systems, the cheaper they'll become. Um, so we're already seeing now in, in, in the United States, a solar plant with storage, um, which has undercut every other form of fossil fuel energy production on a per kilowatt hour basis without subsidy, um, now, now being given the go ahead. So it, it, we, ha we have now crossed that point where solar and storage is now cheaper than fossil fuel production. And I mean, and, and even nuclear is cheaper than nuclear. And that's not, that's not even including the cost of cleaning up nuclear disasters, which is extraordinary. Do you know the cost of cleaning up the Fukushima power plant is something that... 
she you knows money. Three, three quarters of a trillion dollars. And don't forget lives, people. Yeah, and and that's not even fixed yet, and it's still an issue. Um, you know, when a, if a solar plant breaks, you just you find the part of it that's broken and you replace it. It's modular. You know, um, it, no no one has ever died um, because of a fa- solar PV plant breaking. Um, you know, if and it's 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 just such a more elegant system, and it's and it's clean. What are we at efficiency wise for solar panels? So efficiency, we're now around, the, the record for efficiency is 43%, and that's from Spectrolab, which is a Boeing subsidiary. Um, but efficiency is only of interest to you if space is a premium. So efficiency is a, a massive big deal to you if you're NASA, right? Because getting anything up into space is really expensive, and space <laughs> literally is a premium in space, ironically. Um, what we care about here on Earth is efficiency of manufacturing. Like how much energy does it take to make your solar panel? How cheap can we get that solar panel, irrespective of how efficient that solar panel actually is? Like it's all about cost per kilowatt hour produced. Um, and that's why crystalline solar panels are still the most used solar panel. And they're about 17, 18% efficient. And they're gradually increasing over time, not, not exponentially, very linear growth. When I started in the solar industry back in 2008, the solar panel was around 12 or, 12 or 13% efficient. Here we are, 10 years later, we're now at 17, 18% efficient. But don't forget that there is a limit to how much sunlight you can capture. Because if you're, if you're capturing 100% of the sunlight available within a given piece of surface area, what you've done is you've just built a black hole and something from which light cannot escape. And we don't want to be building black holes on the surface of the planet. I think things could stop getting messy. There's people trying to do it. It's, uh... <laughs> we'd, yeah, we start to have some weird... Um, space time phenomena happening in labs yeah so <laughs> it's it's super interesting it's kind of like renting your home versus buying your home if you could get rid of the interest as a kind of analogy solar keeps producing even after you've bought it and so you got to keep paying for gas yeah but. There, there's no there's no more fuel required once you've built once you bought your solar panel it just keeps using electricity passively with no the payback no, period how many months, years, et cetera, is it taking people to recoup a investment? Let's not say through Sun Exchange. Let's say ter- traditional. I want to put solar panels on my roof, et cetera. It's, it's about that. the same. It's about the same. I mean, the, the fact Sun Exchange is designed to be an alternative to putting solar panels on the roof of your own home with the same benefits. Um, and so it's about the same. It's about eight, eight years, I'd say, for a payback um, without subsidy. Obviously, some jurisdictions have tax benefits and um, feed-in tariffs, which, in, which, which bring that in. But that's, that's based on a, on a policy, a government policy, which I, in the UK, we saw the, 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 the negative consequence of that. When that policy was changed, the market collapsed. Um, so you can't, you can't necessarily rely on, on a subsidy to, to support your business model because it can be repealed at any point. Yeah, that's so, what's but, killed renewables in the past, the subsidies yeah, and then the exactly. up and down to the oil pricing. Exactly. So, I mean, here in South Africa, we, we very specifically built our model around this works at this return without any subsidy, without any supportive policy from the government. You know, we're building embedded generation of solar without subsidy, and we're getting you know, paybacks between eight, eight and 10 years. Um, we, uh, the IRR on our projects were around 11%, which is equivalent to about a 6% return a year uh, APR, but it's, it, they're not really comparable. It's like comparing apples to pears because this is a rental income stream that you're receiving, which works out to be about 11% which is equivalent to put it to what you'd get from if you put solar panels on the roof of your own home and own them on the roof of your own home. But with the advantage of if you move home, you no longer have your solar panels. But with solar panels on a roof through Sun Exchange, you don't even need to own a home. You can live in an apartment and own solar panels through, on a roof through Sun Exchange. Is that the future of ownership for everything? Is the future some type of distributed ownership of homes, cars, etc.? Or is it platforms where I subscribe either my city or I subscribe to Uber, et cetera, and it just comes and picks me up wherever with an autonomous dri- vehicle, no I think, driver. I think, I, think the two thing you, I think the two things will merge. You think you'll have both through the same platform. You can then go and buy an Uber car, which then goes and drives around working for you um, without you ever needing to even see the car. Um, I mean, that's what they've been built for in some instances. They've started you know, putting cameras and signing them so the owner of that car can see what the, the, the user of that vehicle is doing at any one point. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, at Sun Exchange, you, you, may, you might not ever see your solar panel that's being used, but we give you live data showing you 
what the electricity is producing. So um, it's, it's, I think ownership is going to become decentralized in itself. I mean, the, the, it's a decentralized world with decentralized ownership, I think is hopefully what we can move towards. Um, rather than a, a world where you've got entirely centralised ownership o over over these new systems. So, what I would hope to see or expect to see is it's a, is a decentralised Uber, um, where you know the actual each individual car in the network can be owned by somebody else or even a group of people. It's really hard, especially with Uber, because you have to have the supply and demand. You kind of have to. The marketplaces are challenging to build. If you can build them and build those incentives in, yeah, you can they theoretically did. upset them. But they did very well. Yeah. Yeah, they did, they did, very, well, they did well. very well with everything but profitability. We'll still see. If, we'll still see. Yeah. We well, that's but that's how they got their user growth. I mean, I, I I read this amazing book called The Startups, which compared you know how Airbnb and Uber actually started and the lengths they went to to get their network started. So they were hanging outside train stations in New York City, like giving mobile phones to taxi drivers, saying like, use this, use this, use this, um, and then. And then, because obviously the riders wouldn't use the network if there weren't drivers available, but then the drivers wouldn't use the network if there weren't rider demand. So they had to very gradually work on keeping that balance. And I mean, us as a, an, I say a sharing economy type platform at some exchange, we, we, we're having to, we have the same challenge. Like we've got to make sure that the numbers of people using our platform, we've got enough solar panels to buy at any one time through the platform. But at the same time, if we've got too many solar panels to buy and not enough demand, then people won't want to, use our platform to become solar powered because that project might not happen. You know? So we, we've got a balance. It is a balancing act. It is a balancing but, act. But, but once you break that, 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 that tipping point, that breakthrough point, when you get your escape velocity, um, then, then things can just uh, shoot up exponentially. And so we, we've got a huge back. We've got so, so many projects that we haven't launched um, that we're waiting to onboard as soon as we've got enough users on the platform to actually meet that, meet that demand. What are the best use cases for blockchain? Not Bitcoin, but blockchain going forward. They can be centralized, they can be decentralized blockchains, but how do you okay. see this evolving? I think records, um, so uh, property ownership, I think is really important. Um, you mean, uh, any, any record of history, um, I mean, the Library of Alexandria was burnt down in, uh, in, in, in ancient times, which allegedly set back human science knowledge by 2000 years. You know, literally put the earth in, in Europe into the dark ages because they burn up all information, never to be retrieved. Um, but the fact that provided you know the, the cryptographic key or the private key of the of your of your record in the Bitcoin blockchain, you can always access that information and that inf information is always going to be there. Um, and anyone can keep a record of that Bitcoin blockchain. So it could be engraved into a gold phonograph disk and sent out into space um, and then recovered a billion years later and you still will have all the records um, that was ever achieved on, on on that record of information. So, and any 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 record of information, um, obviously interaction of money we've, that we've discussed about at length. Um, but I think property records um, is pr probably a really good use case. I would say as well. But how do you think about the immutability of information? For instance, X Y Z actors get naked pictures uploaded online and can never get them taken down. Wow. Or you, or you get, or you get arrested. But it turns out that they were looking for someone who looks just like you, the doppelganger. But you know what? Now this is this applies to Google showing up mm -hmm. when people search for you. The number one result is arrested, yeah. even though so they don't find out. So what you're doing is is the right to be forgotten. Yeah, and it becomes it becomes null and void essentially in blockchains. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you, that that record can only be accessed if you have a public key. So provided that you can. Um, destroy your key that information should theoretically be um if you upload computer. your own naked pictures now if i upload <laughs> abe's, abe's naked pictures abe's in trouble you don't you don't want to see my naked pictures no i don't <laughs> um I, I don't i don't know the answer to that um yeah but, but the fact is the bitcoin blockchain already has weird information on it you know there, there is loads of weird stuff on there that people have put there just for a joke I mean, the first record ever on the genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain is, a, is an article from the Times newspaper, uh, which was to, to commemorate the birth of the, the blockchain, which said that um, uh, the, chance, the chance of the exchequer has just approved a second bailout for the banks. And that newspaper article is now there forever, immutably on the blockchain. Um, and I guess whatever people want to put on there is going to put on there. But I think that as the Bitcoin blockchain increases, it becomes increasingly harder to put stupid information on there that's got no point because it's expensive to do 
you, know, you actually have to pay a fee to put data on, on there. So you're only going to do that if actually you want to do it and there's a value to doing it. Um, if you want to put my naked pictures on there and then 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 ransom me, um, you know that's that's theoretically possible. But it's I guess it's theoretically possible on on any network, is it not? Yeah, it's tough. It's kind of the paradox yeah. of openness versus uh, yeah. closeness. Is how yeah. much how much censorship yeah. do you want? But uh, but, uh, but I think my point is, is that to to put pictures on the block on, on the Bitcoin blockchain is going is going to be so expensive to do. Don't think Bit- don't think Bitcoin. Think blockchain in the future because yeah. the future is not necessarily. I would argue probably not Bitcoin. Well, if you if you've got the rewritable blockchains like Hyperledger, for example, um, then uh, then theoretically you can rewrite the blockchain. Because you, if you if you agree as a consensus to rewrite it, then you can. I mean, they the, they did that with Ethereum. I mean, there was a, a, a the first application on Ethereum was was DAO, the decentralized autonomous organization. Um, there was a bug in that; it got hacked, and so they basically rewound history, ran another chain, and then they called that Ethereum instead. But the original Ethereum blockchain is called now called Ethereum Classic it still exists, an alternative version of history, i.e., the true version of history. But everyone just agreed that actually this turn of history is the correct one, um, which kind of undermined the whole principle of, of, a, of immutability. But they kind of had to because, well, they felt they had to. Everyone got they, screwed. Everyone got screwed. <laughs> can, yeah. you, can you ever actually get all the bugs out of code? I would argue it's probably no, which means that you're kind of always going to have major hiccups if you try to go with a smart contract system. Yeah, it depends on what, what, how complex you're trying to be. I mean, what are you trying to do? I mean, if it's a really, really sort of simple... But if everything's uh, hackable, then everything's buggable, right? Yeah. Um, it depend, again, it depends on the complexity of what you're trying to do. Because if it's something really simple, like this person does this, and this person does this, and this, this event happens, it's basically like a one plus one equals two scenario. Um, but you just basically have... You don't need to have a third party to verify that yeah. one and one have been added in. Matt dies, his assets get transferred to his family, et cetera. Yeah. But then you yeah, have this, yeah. the situation of Matt getting kidnapped or someone impersonating Matt or yeah, but, Matt dying, yeah, but, but also the company that reinforces It's true, that. it's true. But I mean, you've, but now you're talking about off, off-chain source of information. So there's a project called Chainlink, which is kind of a, an off-chain Oracle source platform or, 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 or project, which you basically have um, voters that vote on the reliability of the data being put onto the blockchain. So that's now something that's now starting to expand is how do you take a record of, of Matt's living status and put that onto the blockchain? And there needs to be some, some, tr- some truth, some oracle of truth, which becomes true, uh, is trusted. But if that trust is ever breached, then that node then loses all its power. So there's a disincentive for that node to report false information. So the provider information on that, on that node. Is that the future of social media? So right now I can post an anti-vaxxer thing or I can post a flat earth thing and we've got enough people who are willing to share that around because they think it's true because we don't have anyone actually checking. Is the future having people checking and vetting and I, I upvote something on Reddit and other people do and because other people do, it shows that I'm not an idiot. Yeah, pr- probably, I, yeah. I mean, I'd say without, without a doubt, you're going to have um, p- you know, peer validation, like group validation of, of information, um, which is ultimately probably going to lead to like political uh, it's, it's going to be expression of what your political persuasions are. Um, you know, if, if you if you have a climate change story and you have a group of people saying that climate change is not true, you can probably pinpoint them to a particular political persuasion. It's even more <laughs> dangerous if it's not true. So let's uh, let, let's just yeah. play the devil's advocate argument. First of all, climate change is true, guys. But if it's not, and humans aren't the ones who are causing the problem, then we're certainly more. Well, what, 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 but what I mean, speaking as literally someone who spent four years of my life studying climate change, what is the biggest issue is people misunderstanding the problem. So, I mean, global warming is one aspect of climate change. It, it's not, it wasn't once called global warming and then it was called climate change, like Donald Trump said. He said yeah, it was called global warming and that wasn't working, called it climate change. No, that's not true. Global warming is happening. We're observing it. Global warming is one aspect of climate change, which have got many other aspects, such as ocean acidification caused by increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, such as changing of the surface of the reflectivity of Earth due to deforestation. These are all climate changes. And you cannot deny you cannot deny that deforestation is being caused by humans because we're doing so on a vast scale. 
You cannot deny that the burning of fossil fuels causes carbon dioxide emissions because we can measure it. And we are observing for a very high carbon concentrations increasing. Now, how much you can attribute the global warming to carbon dioxide emissions is now something like 98.5% to certain to be exactly linked to our, to our emissions. So there is some uncertainty, but there's no uncertainty around other aspects of climate change. And switching to a clean energy based economy um, whereby you don't have air pollution, whereby you don't have people going underground, digging up coal and dying of respiratory diseases. And people are, more people die close to coal power stations and oil power stations than, lit, than, than, than nuclear power stations. You know, fossil fuels and, and that's fuel. not even counting cancer. Exa exactly. So you can't deny that the world would be better off without fossil fuels, irrespective of whether you believe climate change is real or not. In which case, if, if you think that climate change isn't real, I suggest check yourself into a university, go and do a degree in the subject, and prove it doesn't exist. Because if you can prove climate change is not true, then you have just become the most clever scientist on earth, because no one else can um, disprove it, because that's how science works. It's real science, you have to set out to disprove it, and no one can disprove it. And that's it, you can't, it, otherwise if you Google, is climate change a hoax? You're, you're just, you're just going to find a source of information that, that confirm your bias. You, know, you have to find, you have to search the alternative of what your belief is in order to disprove something, because that's, that's how science works. That's that the scientific method. The exact opposite of theology, which is where we run into some problems. Let's run in, yeah. let's jump into the bonus round now. So for listeners, this is okay. the part of the episode where we take listener, you guys essentially, if you subscribe and help us, and you donate at a level of five dollars or more a month to help us make this sustainable we have bonus questions with all of our awesome guests and some bonus episodes as well you ready to do it abe yeah uh, the question's already written to the episode let's <laughs> jump back to it i got two last questions for you first what's okay. the one thing i should have asked you that i didn't You there, Abe? Hello, Matt. Yeah, so I am here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Connection a little yeah, yeah, so It's now working again. It's now working okay, again. Good. Okay. So, yeah, you, you froze. So, what was the one thing you didn't ask me? What's um, the one thing I didn't ask you? You didn't ask me um, what music I listened to or what the last book I read. What's the last book? The last book I read was The Future of Humanity by. Miko, someone I'm really bad at author's names. Taco. Yeah, yeah, Miko Taco. Thank you. I've just finished reading that. That's pretty fantastic. What is the future? Um, space. <laughs> space. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I hope so, and then I hope we also don't forget home. Turning, tur yeah, turning Earth into a garden. You know, getting off the planet and letting it recover. Um, but then again, I've seen the film Elysium where people do go to space and just leave Earth an absolute pile of garbage, um, which people then just struggle for existence on whilst building the robot masters which control themselves, which are owned by the people living in space, which is quite a bleak future, but hopefully don't want to don't get there. Yeah, we're, we're headed towards Wally, where Bezos is the, the big and large company and kind of owns it all. Yeah. And now yeah. last, last question before you tell people where to find you, and that is... If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it could be anything. What would it be and why? A call to action, I'd say um, get out there, um, get up, do stuff, um, get off social media, um, stop, stop with social media addictions. It's very important. I think that, yeah, I mean, I'm speaking personally here. I, I know that social media is, can adjust the way your thought patterns work. Um, and they are addictive um, and I would encourage people to, to, to recognize what power and control that has over the way we think and the way we feel um, and, and, and start speaking to people, go to more community events, get involved in your community, um, start attending festivals and, and meeting people. I like it. Bringing the Thanks. humanity back to humanity. Yeah, exactly. Where can people, where can people find you, Abe? Um, what online or in the real world? Oh, both. Um, online, um, you can tweet me at Abe Cambridge. 
um, you can email me abraham.cambridge at the sun um, or you can find me um, somewhere around the southern peninsula of Cape Town <laughs> um, or um, I attend um, I'm going to some music events later this year I'm going to hopefully modem festival in, in Croatia um, and there's an event in the Atacama mountains next year for a total solar eclipse uh, which I will hopefully be attending as well so if you've never seen a total solar eclipse, wow, you're missing out. That's a cosmic phenomenon. Very cool. All your all your solar channels are going to have some trouble. But uh, yeah, they, this is they a... actually observed that. They observed that in Germany. They had a total solar eclipse there last year or a couple of years ago. It was the first time they had a country which was being at the time it was like 50% solar powered, and then they all turned off at once because of the solar eclipse. It's the first time that they had ever been able to witness such such a thing, and but because it was all predictable, they could work around it but it was still interesting to see like the y2k dilemma thanks for coming on yeah. today abe and thanks no for problem. tuning in guys thanks for having me in. guys if you have enjoyed this episode consider sharing it with a friend it's the most important thing that you can do for us if you think other people would benefit from us and benefit from the awesome stuff that gabe has shared that abe has shared sorry on climate change solar energy blockchain bitcoin then share it with a friend help us make this into something that can make an impact on the world Thanks. Cheers. Cool. So I'm going to press stop recording.